In this lesson, we're moving on to defenses to contract formation and enforcement. But before we jump into the defenses, as a quick refresher, how do we go about forming a traditional enforceable contract? Remember, we have three elements. We need mutual assent between the parties, consideration, and no defenses to formation that would invalidate the otherwise valid contract. In case you're wondering where we are in the big picture flow of our contracts analysis, we're still under formation of the traditional enforceable contract, but we're moving on to the D in my cats do sneak. Of course, this D stands for defenses to contract formation and enforcement. So, at this point in our discussion of contracts, right, we're very confident that we know how to determine whether we have a traditional enforceable contract. We know how to make this determination, right? We know we have to ask, do we have mutual sin between the parties, a valid offer and a valid acceptance of that offer? If so, is that mutual assent supported by consideration, right? And we know how to do these first two elements, right? We've talked about them in a ton of detail. So all that's left, if we know if we have mutual assent supported by consideration, our last question before we're ready to come to the conclusion that we have a traditional enforceable contract is going to be whether there's a defense that we can apply that could invalidate the otherwise valid contract. So the defenses we want to focus on in this lesson are up here on the board, right? These are most tested, the must know defenses for contract law, right? We have incapacity, mistake, misunderstanding, misrepresentation, duress, undue influence, illegality, and unconscionability. These are the main ones we all want to make sure we fully understand. We're going to jump into these in a lot of detail. But again, before we start jumping into these and talking about all the requirements and how it plays out, a couple big picture topics we need to cover first. So we understand, again, just to reiterate, at this point in the analysis, when we're moving on to defenses, right? That means we've gone through the M and the C in our formation discussion, right? We've determined that we have mutual assent between the parties, and that mutual assent is supported by consideration. So our final question, so at that point, we know, okay, we have a traditional enforceable contract, unless there is a defense to formation and enforcement that we can apply to the contract that can invalidate it, right? So I keep using the word invalidate the contract, but really the conclusion is either going to be one of two things, right? If we go through and we find that one of these defenses is successful, right? All the requirements are met. We're going to come to one of two conclusions. That means the contract, right? That mutual sense supported by consideration is either void Right, the contract is either void or it's voidable. Void a bull. Right, so this is just a small nuance we want to talk about before we start jumping into all of these defenses, right? Because ultimately, if we find that one of these defenses is successful, that means our conclusion is going to be that the contract is either void or the contract is voidable. So what's the difference here? A void contract is simply the idea that the court is going to treat the contract as though it never existed. It is a 100% nullity. That contract is unenforceable by either party under all circumstances. There's no scenario where a void contract can be enforceable. It is as if the contract never existed. For example, one of the big ones is this idea of illegality, right? Imagine that one party to a contract hires another person to commit murder, right? Well, we're going to say that that contract is void, right? No court is going to enforce that contract in any way, shape, or form, right? It is 100% null. It is void, right? We call that a void contract, and the court treats it as though it never existed. A voidable contract is a little bit different, right? A voidable contract is, a, is an enforceable contract until a party takes steps to get out of the contract or avoid the contract. So it's voidable at that party's discretion. And we'll talk about voidable contracts as we go through, right? The interesting thing there is a lot of times that means only one party is going to be bound to the terms of the contract. And the other party, usually the innocent party, right? The party who's asserting the defense will be free to walk away from the contract at any time, 
But until that happens, we have an enforceable contract, right? So a slight nuance here we want to think about as we go through. And as we talk about these, it'll make more sense as we go through examples. But remember, ultimately our conclusion when we're thinking about the defenses to formation is that if one of these is successful, the contract is either then void or voidable, right? That's always our conclusion with defenses to formation, right? So we're gonna jump into each of these in a lot of detail, but first I'll just do a quick overview of these so we can kind of get a big picture and then we'll just start jumping into them one at a time, right? So incapacity is the idea that in order to enter a contract, both parties must have capacity to enter into the contract. So the big three that we're thinking here that we want to talk about that are most commonly tested when a person might lack capacity would be in the situation where number one, a party to the contract is under the age of 18. Number two would be a party has a mental illness. Number three would be that a party entering into the contract is intoxicated. In those three situations, do those parties have the capacity to contract or do they not have the capacity to contract? We'll talk about that when we get to incapacity. Mistake is just the idea where the party, one party or both parties to the contract is mistaken as to a basic assumption on which the contract is formed. For example, you think you're buying a three carat diamond, but it turns out that the diamond is a worthless pebble, right? That could be a mistake as to a basic assumption on which the contract was made. We'll talk about what happens there. A misunderstanding is when there's a term in the contract that lends itself to different interpretations or meanings, right? I say that I'm going to ship you these goods next Friday. Say today is Thursday. Well, literally, next Friday would be tomorrow, right? If we look at the calendar, next Friday from Thursday is tomorrow. But a lot of people interpret next Friday to mean a week from this Friday, right? So a term like that that's somewhat ambiguous, lends itself to multiple interpretations or meanings, right, can lead to a misunderstanding where usually one party attributes one meaning to a term and the other party attributes a different meaning to the term. What do we do there when there's a misunderstanding? A misrepresentation is simple, right? This is just a lie. It's when a party makes an assertion, a fact that is not true, right? This can be done on purpose, which we call fraudulent misrepresentation, or it can be done on accident, which we call non-fraudulent misrepresentation. Talk about what happens there. Duress is simply the use Duress is simply the use of improper threats to coerce another party. Undue influence is the use of excessive pressure on a party who is susceptible to coerce another party. Right? Illegality is when the consideration used in the contract is illegal or the performance under the contract is illegal. Right? Imagine hiring someone to commit a crime. Illegality. Unconscionability is when the terms of the contract are so unfair or oppressive that it actually shocks the conscience of the court. In that case, the court is going to refuse to enforce that contract as unconscionable. Right. So we're going to jump into all of these defenses in a lot of detail, starting with incapacity. I'm just going to quickly erase some stuff here and draw up some more details on the board for us. So I'll be right back in a second, guys, and we'll jump into incapacity. Thank you so much for watching this video preview of our Legal Education Accelerator Program, or LEAP for short. If you would like to see the conclusion of this video and gain full access to our entire 1L and 2L video library, integrated outlines, streamable audio versions, additional practice exams with explanations, and much more, we invite you to head over to our website and join the thousands of law students who have already enrolled. To get started with your no-risk free trial today, simply click the link in the description box below or visit www.studicata.com forward slash leap.
Hi everyone, my name is Serena and I'm currently a law student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Shiva and I'm currently a law student at Southwestern. Hi everyone, my name is Michelle um, and I am a first year student at South Texas College of Law, Houston. Um, I used the Studicata study video series last semester to help me prepare mostly for contracts um, and I actually made an A plus in contracts last semester which I greatly dedicate to the Studicata video. By using Studicata to help me prepare for my final exam, I was able to score the highest grade out of my class on the final and even have my uh, essay distributed as the model answer. Not to mention I had done quite poorly on the midterm and was struggling throughout the whole course of the semester, understanding the material and keeping up with lectures. Because of the Studicata video lectures, I was able to go into my exams with a feeling of confidence. I didn't have to worry about what the rules of law were or how I was going to organize my answer to an essay question. I would absolutely recommend the Studicata series and their online course materials to anyone. Um, I think that they are not like um, professor lectures that you might find online or other outside study materials that you may encounter. Um, I think that the Studicata videos really focus on not only ensuring that you understand the material that you're going to encounter on your final, um, but they also help you to understand kind of the best method for test taking and they really break down how to approach each problem and the best ways to tackle certain methods on testing um, and I think that's really important and I think it's really special. I don't see that anywhere else um, in any of the other online resources that I've found. So I would certainly recommend Sudakata to anyone who is studying in law school right now. Um, good luck on your studying and you're going to do great. I would definitely uh, recommend Studicata to anybody watching this video. Uh, give it a chance. I'm sure, I'm positive that you will love it, uh, that you will get a lot out of it, uh, and that you will be happy that you gave it a chance. Uh, I definitely am. I know I will be using uh, Studicata in the future. And I cannot thank Studicata enough for getting me through my first semester of law school. I will definitely, definitely continue to watch the Studicata video lectures throughout my law school career. And I highly recommend that any future or current law student do the same.